translated often as mind. And persons coming from a Western empirical scientific background generally think that the mind is an emergent property of the brain. The yoga systems say, no, that's not a fact. The, the brain is just like a, uh, like a radio. And just as a radio picks up waves and then turns them into the sound. So similarly, uh, the, uh, the brain, uh, just as a radio, can't make sound by itself, but it has to be manipulated subtly by the radio waves. So in the same way, the brain cannot function without the presence of the citta, the waves of the mind. So the mind itself is actually a substance. It's a very fine substance. It's a substance which is outside the range of our sense perception. For example, with your eye you can see so far. If you take a telescope you can see even further. But anyway, there's a horizon you can't see beyond that. So in the same way, our senses can perceive uh, solid things, gross physical things, we can perceive fire, more gaseous things, but then when it comes to space, we can't, we can't perceive space, and anything that's even more subtle than space, it's just way be beyond our perceptual horizon. So the mind stuff, chitta, is like that, it's a very, very fine uh, media, and it's very sensitive. And the oscillations, what we have is the oscillations in the chitta, in the mind stuff. That is what we experience as all of our thoughts, feelings, conceptions, emotions, whatever's going on in there and whatever you're feeling, these are just waves, different types of waves in the mind stuff, chitta. And as long as the, the chitta is unsteady, then the, our conscious self, Atma, the soul, identifies with the physical body. Hmm? We feel intuitively that I am this body and whatever uh, designations are connected to the body, such as being male or female or young or old or black or white or from Argentina or America or Peru, wherever you're from. All these things are designations connected to the body. But the self, Atma, the conscious self, who we really are, is transcendental, eternal, beyond all of these temporary designations. But as long as the mind is oscillating, the, the soul feels as if I, I am this body. So one may say, well, that's a pretty powerful illusion. And because it's really, we really feel like with this body. And so a person who's educated and intelligent might think, no, no, I couldn't be fooled like that. Hmm? I'm not, I'm not sus susceptible to illusion like that. But just see, every night when you fall asleep, in your dream, uh, you have a body, an astral body in your dream. And you're wandering around here and there doing so many, so many different things. Did, did anyone ever have a dream that they were at work? Did you ever have a dream that you were at work? Yeah. yeah. So when you woke up, did you get paid? Then why didn't you take the day off? So there's a reason. Because as soon as we go into a dream and we have that dream body, we totally think this is me. Even though we're physically lying on a bed somewhere, we're convinced that this a uh, subtle body that we have in a dream is, is myself. So if a person said, well, I'm really smart, I have a doctorate, I don't, I'm not gullible, I'm not susceptible to illusion. No. You see how every night we go into illusion. So, from the, by extension of that, we should be able to appreciate that we're not only in illusion when we're asleep, but we're also in illusion when we're awake as well. And we haven't fully woken up yet. Only when the mind becomes steady. In Bhagavad Gita also, Sri Krishna gives a similar definition. As Patanjali said, Samatvam Yoga Uchati. It means that equanimity of mind is called yoga. Equanimity.
unity of mind is called yoga. So, there are degrees of turbulence within the mind stuff. Uh, who's heard of the uh, gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas? Anyone? If you're familiar with those, a little bit. Yeah. So essentially, sattva, rajas and tamas are three degrees of uh, disturbance or turbulence or, or natural functioning or malfunctioning within the jitta, the mind stuff. So, essentially, the mind stuff by nature uh, expands and contracts. It expands and contracts. The more the jitta is expanded, then the more the surface becomes very steady and peaceful. And the more it contracts, the more there's a lot of interference and lots of waves. And when it become, when the jitta, the consciousness, the mind stuff becomes very contracted, then even the, the functions of the mind interfere with each other so much that there's a breakdown in proper function and there's a mental inertia. So these three, what are called gunas in Sanskrit, three mental qualities are called sattva, rajas and tamas. So sattva is when the, when the mind stuff is very expanded and the mind is very peaceful. And then rajas, the, all the functions are condensed because the consciousness is contracting and it becomes very turbulent. And then tamas, darkness, is when the chitra is very contracted and the mind's not even functioning anymore. So we can give some practical examples. Um, an example of when the mind is not functioning is when you become very, very tired. Right? When you're really tired, you just can't think. Someone asks you a question, you say, oh, don't bother me now. Well, let's talk tomorrow. And you become really tired. So that means the chitta, the, the mind stuff is contracting and contracting until it's not functioning anymore and what, you just black out. And that's sleep. That's sleep. You, you cannot live without sleep. So, and then what happens, gradually, gradually, uh, as you're, after your uh, chitta has contracted for some time, it begins to bounce back. It's like a pendulum swinging. So it contracts for some time, and then it begins to open again. And as it opens, you begin to wake up. And it may be if, if you've had very little sleep and you took rest late, then your mind is still groggy and not functioning very well. So then, what do you do? Coffee. Right? Well, you shouldn't really, actually. If you want to meditate, you shouldn't take uh, stimulants and stuff like that. But most people do. They take something to stimulate themselves and get all the, the mental functions flowing. Mm -hmm. So that's called rajas, the mode of passion. And then the mind is very, very busy and is filled with ambitions and dreams, I want to do this, I want to achieve that. Uh, but there's a very strong bodily identification. And there's all mm, lust, anger, greediness, all these types of qualities they come. But if the mind expands even more mm, and becomes very, very broad, then all the waves die down. And that is called sattva, peace, the state of peacefulness. So. In the Bhagavad Purana, there's a very beautiful Sanskrit verse there describing this expansion and contraction of the mind. It says, Bhutanam Chidradatritvam Bahir Antara Evaja Manopranindriya Atma Disnam Nabaso Vriti Lakshanam. The meaning is this that in Vedic cosmology, you have earth, water, fire, air, and then the next element is called Akash, ether, the ethereal element. So this verse is a description of Akash, ether. So it's said that ether gives a chidra, that means room to move, out 
outwardly. So there's distance between us because there's ether between us. The akash is between us. But it also gives room to move inwardly as well. So outer and inward accommodation is the function of akash, ether. And then the next panindriyat medisnya tam. It is a field. The akash is the field where the mind, the pran, and the senses meet together. Hmm? So just as three people can meet together in a room, so the akash is the accommodating space where your mind, your pran, and your senses meet together. And they all influence each other. Hmm? So what your pran is doing affects your mind. What your mind is doing affects your pran. What your senses are doing affects your pran, which affects your mind, and vice versa. So there's causal chain going out. Your mind obviously affects the things that your senses do, and what your senses do will feed back into the mind as well. So, hmm? let's consider how the pran uh, which is governing your breath is affecting the mind so you're breathing all the time just check you can just check right now in which nostril the, your breath is moving most clearly just close one and sniff and then close it up did you notice that one is more open than the other Whose right side was more open? Uh -huh. Whose left side was more open? Uh -huh. Okay. So what happens is, the, the pran, the subtle energy which is manipulating your body and also uh, the causing fluctuation of the mind, is moving from side to side. Uh, there, there are three main channels of pran, three main nadis. There is a pingala, goes through the right nostril, either through the net left nostril, and the shashumna nadi is in the middle. So for almost everyone, for most persons, the shashumna nadi is blocked. It's blocked. And when the pran is moving in the shashumna nadi, that's the sattvic state. So most people are not in that peaceful sattvic state, but they're oscillating between being kind of tired and being wired. Tired and wired. <laughs> Sometimes you're tired and sometimes you're wired, right? But very rarely people in today come in a really sublime and serene, peaceful state. So when the pran is moving more on the right side, that's when you're wired. You're busy. And when it's moving more to the left, now you're on the more kind of tired cycle. Maybe your attention won't be so strong then. And this is, you can check it. It's changed about every 90 minutes, it's moving from side to side. Now, it said that the, the right side is the sun side, corresponds to the sun, because our body is a, is a microcosm of the universe, actually. So all the elements which are there in the universe are also in your body, and vice versa. So you can know about the nature of the universe by your introspection. About, towards yourself. Huh? So the right side is the sun side, it's heating. Hmm? And the left side is the cool side. So for example, in Ayurveda, after eating, you lie down on your left side. And it closes the cool and opens the heat because you need heat for digestion. You see, so it helps your digestion if you lie on the left side. Huh? So, also, if you look in the universe, what happens? The sun rises, and then the moon sun sets, and the moon rises, and the sun rises, and the moon rises, and that's time. The days of your life are passing. That's the influence of time. So similarly, this changing of the pran is the effect of time on your body. So the more your breathing is erratic, the more your mind is unstable, then the more stress you feel, the more time is affecting your body moving from side to side and the quicker you grow old and 
things start to fall apart and everything. You, know, you see, so that's why people who do yoga and pranayama or people who do meditation, they tend to be more well preserved. I mean, look at me, I am 74. <laughs> so, just kidding. I'm 50. So, um, so there's so many things that we can learn about the universe, about time, just by the introspection of the body. And the Vedic scriptures have described all these things in, in, in great detail. Now, what happens is, when you're on a more domestic cycle, but then the consciousness contracts more, and when you're on the rajasic cycle, it opens more, and sattvic, then it becomes really expanded. What's the benefit of knowing about this? There's a great benefit. Each and every one of us, we're looking for happiness. That's what motivates us to wake up in the morning and do the things we do in life. We want to find happiness. But what is happiness? What is it? If you ask different people, they'll give a different explanation of, they'll probably say happiness is a good feeling, I feel well, I feel blissful, something like that. But what gives happiness to different people? They'll say, well, I like, I get happiness from whatever, watching soccer or playing basketball, or I get happiness from hiking or playing guitar, or everyone has different ideas. Hmm? From my family, hmm? from praying, whatever, people have different ideas. If you want to know what happiness is, then look at the nature of chitta, and how it's expanding and contracting in the akash. You see, when the, when the mind stuff is expanding, then you feel bliss. It's like, ah, you feel like this internal space, a lightness. And when the chitta, the mind stuff is contracting, that's when you feel heavy and everything's a struggle. You notice that when you're under stress and you're in a difficult situation, you don't feel happy, that your mind is just focused on just a little incident like something is happening right in front of you now you know you you have a flat tire and you're late for going somewhere you're just like right there and you don't have big thoughts you don't see the big picture because when the when the chitta contracts then you just have a very localized your thoughts move around in a very localized way and you don't see the big picture of things but then when the chitta expands then you can have more grand meta thoughts so, when people are looking for happiness, what they're ex ex essentially trying to do is focus their mind on something. Because as soon as the mind becomes focused on something, it, the chitta begins to expand. For example, maybe you're stressed out. Have you ever been stressed out and thought, I really need some chocolate? Yeah? Yeah, right, okay. So what happens, when there's some experience, you, you're stressed out and you want some relief, you take something like chocolate, and then you, what happens, your mind becomes totally absorbed, just tasting that, you become focused on that. And as soon as the mind is focused on something, it begins to expand, and that's what gives you the relief. So the happiness and distress is not the chocolate. It's the expansion and contraction of the mind. For example, let's say people that like to watch some football game. They sit down in front of the TV or in the stadium and they fix their mind on a ball and they just watch it. Going here back for like an hour or two hours or whatever. And they feel great. They don't under, they're thinking that I'm happy because football makes me happy or something. It's not that. It's when the mind becomes focused on something, it automatically expands and that gives a feeling of relief and, and uh, some internal space, you feel light, you see. So each person 
according to their own experience, their own impressions and so on, they're trying to expand their consciousness in a simple way, whatever it is. But the problem is this, that just trying to expand the consciousness and feel that inner lightness by tasting things, eating things, whatever, fighting, having sex or whatever it is you, you do to, to get relief, <clears throat> it gives a momentary relief. The consciousness expands a little bit, but then it just contracts again. It's not steady. So when, when it contracts again, after that experience, you feel down. Huh? And then you think, oh, I want to, I have to do that experience again. And then it becomes like an addiction cycle where you need more, but then you feel worse afterwards and then you need more and then you feel even worse afterwards, like that. And so the more we try to find happiness through physical stimulation, actually the more miserable we become. And that's the sad, that's the tragic position or situation of almost everyone in the world, you know? That's the tragedy. You can write, a, Shakespeare can write a drama about that. The tragic life of nearly everyone in the world <laughs> is just this pendulum swing of trying to be stimulated, feeling a high, and then crashing again and doing the same thing over and over again. So, spiritual life is a different, has a, it's a different process. Instead of trying to fix the senses on some objects that we become addicted to, we try to focus our mind upon transcendence through mantra. So for example, we've just been singing you can sing, you can sit, sometimes we use a mala, like a rosary. And this is common in all religions. In Christianity they have rosary, in Islam they have a rosary, in Sikhism they have a rosary. Almost all the religions of the world, they have some time, Buddhism they have a rosary. And they sit and then you say a prayer uh, on each bead of the rosary and they go one after another. And so what you're doing is, you're focusing the mind on one thought, thoughts of God. Now you may or may not know God, or what God is like or anything. It doesn't matter. The vibration of the mantra is non-different from God Himself. In philosophy, that's called onomatodoxy. That's the, that's the, the technical term which is used in Christianity. Onomatodoxy. Onomata means uh, the similarity of uh, the oneness of sound. So onomatodoxy means the theory that the vibration of the name of God and God Himself are one reality. So in mantra meditation, essentially what we're doing, we sit and we begin to utter the mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Rama. Now the mind is fixed on a subject, but this subject is not an external subject. So it doesn't give you a quick rush and it doesn't give you a crash either. But what happens is there's a slow, gradual, slowly but surely, each day that you meditate, your chitta, your mind is expanding a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, until finally you stay permanently in a fully extend, expanded state. Now, we raised the question before about happiness. I want to say that Sanskrit, the mm, Yoga Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, all the Vedas, they're written in the Sanskrit language. So Sanskrit is really our mother language. Because all English, Spanish, German, Italian, or Russian, Lithuanian, all the Indian languages like uh, Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, Gujarati, all, all the Indian languages, all the European languages, they're called Indo-European languages, meaning that you can trace them all back. Uh, generally, the European languages go back through Latin and Greek, and you trace them back and come to Sanskrit. Sanskrit. It's a great word, Sanskrit. Uh, 
I'm going here and there a little bit, but we're going to explain about happiness, but it's just come to me now, just to mention the meaning of the word Sanskrit. Sun means completely or perfectly, and Krit means formed. And the word, the word Sanskrit is a language, and Sanskriti, Sanskriti means culture, culture. Sanskriti means culture. So what is culture? In the Vedas it means this. Your mind in its pure state is very peaceful. So the natural state of the mind is called Prakriti. Natural. Prakriti means natural. But when the mind becomes all compressed and oscillating, that's called distortion. Now. The mind which is meant to be peaceful and small has become turbulent and distorted. So that word in Sanskrit is Vikriti. So your Prakriti, your nature has become Vikriti, distorted. Hmm? Now there's a way of living. There's a way of eating. There's a way of praying. There's a way of architecture. There's a way of art. There's a way of poetry. So that whole culture which contributes to undoing, reversing that distortion, bringing you from the state of Vikriti, distorted mind, to Prakriti, a natural state of mind, that is called Sanskriti. Uh, so Prakriti means natural, Vikriti means distorted, and Sanskriti is the, the uh, culture which un that reverses that distortion and brings us to a natural state of mind. So that is Sanskriti, the Vedic culture. So it's done by Sanskriti, Sanskrit. These are, words are connected. Sanskar. Sanskar. The Sanskriti, the culture that gives you Sanskar. Sanskar means impressions in the consciousness which bring about that higher state of mind. So just, you know, whatever, being um, very immoral or irreligious or sinful, that causes the vikriti, the complete breakdown of the mental functions. So being dharmic, following dharma, being religious, being sattvic, being ethical and moral, that make, those activities make a sanskar impressions which are sanskar purifying and bringing us back to our nature. Now, happiness, we're talking about happiness and distress. The mind stuff is expanding and contracting in the akash, in the ether, right? Okay, so this ether akash in Sanskrit is also called ka. The word ka means ether. In Gita, Krishna said, Shabda ke, I am the sound that moves ke through the ether. So ka means ether. That is the meeting place of the mind, the senses, and the pran. Okay. So, in Sanskrit, the word beautiful is su, beautiful. So when you take this word, beautiful ether, that your consciousness is spread, expanded, and uh, very smooth, peaceful, in the, in the ether, that's called sukha. Beautiful, the ether is, the, the inner atmosphere is sukha, the inner atmosphere is beautiful. So that's called hakta sukha, that your chitta is expanded in the ether. And then dhuka, du means mm, dirty or polluted. Mm? So dhuka, distress means your chitta, your mind stuff has contracted in the ether. So the actual words in Sanskrit for happiness and distress, sukha and dhuka, exactly, precisely, scientifically and metaphysically explain what happiness is and what sadness is also. You see, it's that sukha, expansion in the ether and dukkha, contraction in the ether. So, if we want to have a very sublime consciousness, then we have to learn how to live our life in a disciplined way that brings about the gradual expansion of the consciousness. So, when the consciousness is very turbulent, you cannot see the nature of the world and the nature of the self. 
But when the consciousness spreads out and becomes smooth and still, now it becomes a reflecting medium, a very good reflecting medium. So in the Bhagavad Purana, there it says, Swachatvam Avikaritvam Shantatvam Iti Saha, which means when the chitta, the mind stuff is sattvic, expanded, it has three qualities. First, uh, the sh uh, shantatvam. Shantatvam means that you don't feel hankering. I need this, I need this. That's actually the real nature of dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction means that you feel like you need stuff that you don't have. Right? So if you're poor, you think, I need money. But people who have money, they're also dissatisfied thinking I need to get more money or I need to get this or get, get divorced and get another wife or whatever it is, uh, like that. So the happiness or satisfaction is not about the things that we have or even the situation that we're in. It's the inner atmosphere of our mind. So when the chitta is expanded and it's smooth and undisturbed, then one quality is shantatvam, a peacefulness where you don't feel that you need external things. You're content. Then the other one is avikaritvam. There's no distortion. Vikar means oscillations in the mind. So you don't get a distorted vision of life. And the primary quality is called swachatvam, means clarity, clear. Just like a mirror is very still. So when you come in front of a mirror, you clearly see yourself. So in the same way, when the chitta is very, very still and clear, you can see your soul. You can see your soul there. And you understand, I'm a spiritual being. I'm beyond time. I was never born and I will never die. I am not this physical body. And not only when the chit is clean, can you see yourself, your soul. But in the commentary on the Bhagavad Purana, the great saints have said the quality swachatvam, clarity, is also called Bhagavada Bimbhagarhitva, the power to catch the reflection of the form of God. Bhagavad Bimbhagarhitva. In other words, when the mind is very, very steady, and you're absorbed in remembering the mantra, then you can see the form of God far out. That's amazing. And the reason why that's really significant is because the greatest happiness that anyone can experience is love. The greatest happiness is not getting stuff for ourselves. The greatest happiness is giving joy to the person that you love. So in the physical plane, all the relationships that we have, they come and go. Just like in one night, you, you dream and then you go back down into deep sleep. And then you dream again, another episode, and then you go back into deep sleep. So you have a uh, dream state come several times during the night, interrupted by the darkness of deep sleep. So actually each life is like that. You live a life and then you, you become unconscious. Death. And then you have another life. And then again. Like this. So any relationship we experience on the physical plane is destined to just be dissolved, to be lost in the stream of time. And because all living entities here, we are very minute, we are very limited. So one person cannot really fully reciprocate the love of another person. So when the heart becomes steady and pure and the vision of God is reflected there, now we can have an eternal, unbreakable, loving relationship. And because the source of all souls, you know, just like the sun shines and millions of photons Tiny particles of energy are coming from the sun. So in the same way, each one of us, we're like a tiny photon, a particle of the energy of God. But God is the source of all. 
So once the soul becomes connected, the word yoga means union, connection. So the ultimate goal of yoga is to have that connection with the Supreme Sun, that the individual soul becomes connected in love with the ocean of love, Sri Krishna. So perhaps some of you, have you heard of the, the Gayatri Mantra? You know, does anyone know the Gayatri Mantra? You know? So just say. Oh. Yes. Yes, yes, okay, good, good. Others know from a Gayatri? I'm going to ask you to recite, but anyway. But, yeah, so all the Vedic, li Brahma Gayatri is a mantra, and that mantra is called Veda Mata. It means the mother of the Vedas. In other words, there are many mantras and very, so many different descriptions of different types of knowledge in the Vedas. But they're all expanding from this Brahma Gayatri. The seed is Om. Om is a seed. And then from that seed came and the whole Gayatri Mantra came from there. And then from that came all the, the rest of the Vedas. Rig Veda, Sama Veda, that all manifested from that. So, the meaning of this mantra, Tat Savitur, means that, Savitur means sun. That God is like the sun. Just as the sun is giving heat and light and life to the whole universe. So God is the source of all existence like the sun. Hmm? And Dimahi, uh, the Savitur is in the singular, but Dimahi means we meditate, it's in the plural. It's in the plural. So that means that each one of us, we're individual souls. Because some people have this idea that when you meditate, then you become one, you become God basically, something like that. Hmm? But the Vedas don't say that. That the sun, the spiritual sun, Krishna, from whom everything comes, is in the singular case. And the, those who are meditating, Dimahi is in the plural. So the many souls, we meditate together on our source. And by His mercy, may He manifest. May we have that divine realization. So, uh, that is the ultimate stage of yoga. The beginning stage of yoga, you can see it, you can do some breathing, try to make your mind stable, try to focus like that. That's the very rudimentary stage. But the ultimate stage of yoga is the bhakti. The loving relationship between the soul and Krishna. That's the, that's the ultimate stage, that's where we want to be going. Now, some people, of course, they do a lot of yoga sadhana, pranayama, and everything. But we see that those who are practicing bhakti yoga, sometimes they don't even do ashtanga yoga, they don't do pranayama. Hmm? They just sing. So a question comes, can you become enlightened? Can you get that level of expansion of consciousness and realize God? just by singing or sitting and doing the japa, repeating mantra? Or do you have to do all the physical, the asanas and the pranayama and actually physically take control of the, the movements of prana in the body? Hmm? Good question. Yes. Good question. So the answer is that some persons practice the astanga yoga, the physical yoga, and then they mix bhakti with it. So that's called mm, bhakti mishra yoga. They're doing yoga and they're mixing some bhakti with it. And that's good, they'll make progress. Mm. And some persons, they just do shuddha bhakti, pure bhakti. They only do devotion, they don't mix, they may do yoga for their health. But as a path of enlightenment, they're just doing the bhakti, the chanting of the mantra. Can they get the effect of controlling prana? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And the reason is this, because when we, uh, when we articulate, when we articulate a mantra, it's explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam, let me see, 
tuos kento. Sa eiva jivo vivara prasuti, prani na goshi na guham pravista. The meaning is that when you speak, the sound doesn't start here. It starts in the Mul Adar Chakra. First, there's a slight movement of pran. If someone's a professional singer, they'll all tell you that they, they're breathing and you have to sing from down here. You don't sing from here. You'll strain your voice. You sing from down here. So it starts with a movement of pran in the Mul Adar Chakra. And sound in that level is called para. And then it moves up and it comes to the Manipura Chakra. And, the, and the, the movement of prana now is going through the mental element, through the mind stuff. And so, just like your mind is going like this, but when you put sound, the prana is going through it on the way to produce a sound. Now that vibration captures whatever's going on in your mind and takes over. No, just like there's some waves in a river, but when the river meets the ocean, the waves in the ocean are stronger and they overpower it. So you've got thoughts going on in your mind, but when you go to chant the mantra, then the, the, the movement of pran which is required to produce the sound of the mantra, to manifest the sound of the mantra, because you're not producing the sound, it's, it will manifest. Uh, that will take control of the movement of prana in the mind also. Then it comes to the Anahata Chakra. So first para, pas, the sound here is called Pasyanti. And then the sound in the mm, Anahata Chakra is called the Madhyama, Anahata. And now you can really hear the internal sound. And then it comes to the Vishuddhi Chakra and then it manifests in the sound that you can hear. So when you speak, that's what happens. It happens very quickly. Mm? That's why when you're speaking, you're, mm, you have thoughts. For, your thoughts are coming first and then the sound comes. In other words, you, your thoughts are turning into a description of what you're thinking in your mind. You know, because it comes from here and comes through the mental and intellectual level before it comes out. Okay. So that's common to everyone who's speaking. However, when you chant the names of God, when you repeat the mantra with devotion, then what happens is that because the vibration of God's name is not different from God Himself, this is not a movement of pran which is just rajas. There is an appearance of what is called aprakrita pran, that is spiritual energy, God's own transcendental energy. What moves us in this world is rajas, the mode of passion. Hmm? But when you repeat mantra, it starts, you, it starts like a mundane sound. You just, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. It begins like a mundane sound. But as you begin to chant under the guidance of your guru and with devotion, with surrender, letting go of all external uh, infatuation with external things, then Krishna himself in the form of his spiritual energy, a prakrita pran, becomes one with your pran and starts to appear and it takes over your mind. So Rupa Goswami has described this in Bhakti Rasa Mrtasindhu. Avir bhuya mano brito prajanti tat swarupatam. When the energy of devotion appears, it appears in the mano briti, the movements of pran in your mind. And the spiritual energy becomes one with your own pran. Hmm? And then the mantra manifests outwardly on your tongue. So this chakra, this heart chakra, as you know, is called anahata. Anahata chakra. Anahata. The word ahat, ahat means struck. Because when you, if you get two things, uh, like your hands or these instruments, the cartels, you strike them, and a sound comes out, right? So that's called ahat, ahat nad, sound which is produced by striking. But when you utter the mantra, 
then the sound comes from inside. That is called anahat, unstruck sound. Mm. Huh? This sound was not was not your hand striking or a cartel striking. It was not the movement of air striking against your vocal cords. That's also a hat sound when you speak. Hmm? Because the air is rising, it strikes your vocal cords, and according to the shape that you make with your mouth, then the a, a, e, e, u, u, the vowels manifest. So that's a hat nad, struck sound. But this is anahatanad. It's a sound that you can hear in your heart. Uh, but there was no striking. It wasn't produced by a striking. So that is Shabda Brahma, spiritual sound. Spiritual sound. So when the person is becomes deeply absorbed, your first stage of chanting, it's just kind of mechanical. Then as you surrender uh, and you begin to become absorbed in the mantra, according to the instructions given by Guru, the spiritual master, then Nam Prabhu. Uh, God Himself in the form of spiritual sound begins to take over your mind and then the vibration comes out. But you see in your heart the form of Krishna. First the chitta becomes steady like a mirror and then you can see Krishna. So the Vedic literature say Premanjana Charita Bhakti Vilochanena Santak Sadeva Rijayeshu Vilokayanti Yamshava Sundra Machinti Puna Sarupam Govindamadi Purusham Tamam Bajani. Which means that those uh, sages who have uh, surrendered fully and developed bhakti, love for Sri Krishna, then they see the beautiful form of God in their heart, which is Achintya. It's beyond the capability of the mind. The material mind and intelligence cannot conceive of what the transcendental realm is like. So the energy of the transcendental realm has to come here and take over your internal organs, your faculties of perception and manifest within the heart. And in this way one gets direct realization of the soul and direct realization of Krishna and the eternal love. So at the end of your life, when this body falls apart, then the soul enters directly into the transcendental world. Because there's a principle, yam yam vapis prambhavam chadyatyanti kalevram. Whatever you think about at the last moment of your life, you become that. So there are histories in the Vedas. Once there was a, a, a sage and he was meditating in the forest but he got attached to a baby deer and he was feeding the deer and playing with the deer and he became attached and he, he became slack in his meditation and when he was old at the last moment of his life he was thinking of that sweet deer and in his next life he became a deer so whatever you think of it in the last moment of your life you'll become like that you'll go to that destination so if during our life every day we meditate and we become absorbed in Krishna, then at the last moment of your life what happens is all the things that you've been doing throughout your life flash before your eyes. You know, people say that who've had a near-death experience. I saw my whole life just flash before my eyes. It's in fast forward, like a video in fast forward. So if your daily life has been one of devotion, prayer, meditation and serving, serving the Krishna, serving the spiritual master and the devotees, then that accumulates in the last moment of your life. All that devotion, all those devotional activities will combine together and you will transcend. Otherwise, what will happen? You, you remember your dog or you remember your girlfriend and then you become a woman in your next life. Like this, it's, it's, uh, the mind is unsteady, anything can happen. Uh, so it's very important to have a daily practice of prayer, meditation and devotional activities and then uh, one can realize the spiritual world in this life and in the end you can graduate from this. this. This world is like a college, you know, it's a learning experience. You can graduate, you don't have to go back and do the year again. Uh -huh. So.
that's the perfection of our life. To develop that love here and then attain the eternal spiritual world. And it all becomes possible by Bhakti Yoga. So Astanga Yoga can be good, it's good for the health of this vehicle. But as a process of self-realization, the chanting of the mantra, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is completely independent and provides you with all the benefits of pranayama and more uh, because of the way in which the Shanta Brahma, the Anahatna, the unstruck sound manifests through the Aprakrita Pran, supernatural Pran and then comes out like this. So I complete our discussion for today on the subject of, of happiness what is real happiness and how to attain it and the nature of the mind and how to an akash sukhanduka and uh, ultimately how to find the highest happiness that is to be established in love you see you can't love a person you've never seen so it's really important to come to that stage where the chitta is clear enough to have a divine vision and then you can really fall in love with the source of existence, Shri Krishna. Thank you. Hari. So I'm sure you have some some questions have come up during this discussion. So whatever's on your mind, we can have a little discussion now. You can share it, and then after that we'll have a kirtan, and then I believe there's some some prasadam for everyone as well. So any question? Yes, your name, sir? Uh, Vishwarup Das. Vishwarup. Oh. Okay. Yes. Um, what about for people who can't sit down every day and just chant? This is, I mean, this is not so much of a personal question, but uh -huh. is there practicality in chanting even if it's not devoting a, a lot of amount of time to chanting? It's like, for instance, it's like, I personally, sometimes I feel like it's not even worth chanting if I'm not sitting down and actually devoting my energy to it. Yeah. Instead of just chanting while I'm driving or like right. while I'm working. Yeah. yeah, so you know, it's not black and white. It's a spectrum, it's a sliding scale. So, all chanting, whenever you chant is good. It's all good, it's all auspicious and the beneficial. However, if you really want to advance, you have to sit down like a statue and don't slouch be straight really straight and and actually in the definition of japa it's called japa when you just quietly you know repeat the mantra to yourself it says this is from uh, Hari Bhakti Vilas. So, the meaning is this. You should put the mantra in your mind and put your mind in the mantra. So it's an interesting thing because let's say you have a box. Right? You can put something in the box, but then you can't put the box inside the thing that was in the box. You know, 3D it doesn't work with 3D things. But with meditation, you put the mantra in your mind, and then you put your mind in the mantra. And you do that again and again, until they're completely blended together. Mano mantram samayoktam. Now they're completely one. In other words, there's no difference between your mental function and the vibration of the mantra they become one and when you're in that state and you stay there that is called japa and if you're not doing that it's not japa it's just like pulling a string so pulling a string an actual japa meditation is not the same thing so it's good to know the definition so you should aim for that that there's no it's not that the vibration of the mantra is going on on one part of your you know hard drive and another part is doing something else. Uh, it has to be a complete unification of the mantra and the mind that there's nothing else going on. Then it's called Japa. And that's, that's the best. And, but there's something even better than that. 
And that is that that state can be can be attained not when you're sitting, but when you're with a group of devotees and everyone singing loudly and dancing. That's another way to attain the full absorption of the mind and the mantra. And that's even more powerful. It's even more powerful than Japa. But we should do both. It's necessary. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave the instruction that to chant your Japa in the morning and then in the evening come together with others and sing and, and do Kirtan. So, and in regard to your question about time, time, yeah, you do, it's important. You know, in the beginning, just if you can do 15 minutes, it's good. If you can increase to 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, two hours is good. Three hours, really good. Five hours, then you can really start making progress a lot. So, in India, in India, in our ashram, you can come and stay in our Chaitanya Academy in India. Um, every morning, we sit for some hours with, all together with the devotees and sit together and be really focused. And I mean, there are some people here who have done this. How was it? Amazing. Right? Do you feel yourself making some progress? Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's habit. You have, you have to make a habit of it. And, and, and very often, we're so caught up in the drama of life that we can't get the momentum to make that habit. So when you stay in an ashram for some time with those who already have that habit, then it's much easier for you to become strong. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Uh, the, the vibration of the mantra, you say that you put the mind in the mantra, the mantra in the mind. And by repeating sometimes, it could be possible that just become a mechanical function. So, what is the idea of sentiment? Well, the spirit should be one of surrender. Because the obstacle in, in meditation is that the mind wants to go out. Instead of going in, being, being the antaramuk, internal, uh, introvert, it wants to go out, extrovert, into the sense objects. So the spirit is one of surrender. O Sri Krishna, supreme Lord, most beautiful and attractive, loving and merciful Lord, I am your eternal servant and I surrender to you. It's enough. And just hear. Just hear. Some persons think that it, you should do some creative visualization or something. But the fact is that transcendence is beyond the capacity of the human mind. The human mind cannot conceive of it. So one should just hear. And then Gradually, gradually, the, the holy name will take over the riches of the mind and then you, won't, you can remember the spiritual world without any effort. So there's a great sage named Vishnath Chakri Thakur and he said that mm, mm, sm uh, Smarana Prayatna Shravana Kirtana Shravana Kirtana it means for one who's engaged in chanting and hearing, they don't have to make any effort to do smaranam or meditation on the spiritual world. It's not required because the name itself will take you into that realm. So smarana prayatnaha means the effort to do uh, any type of visualization Shravana Kirtanavato Na Vasaka For those who are engaged in hearing and chanting it's not necessary not necessary One thing is helpful though very helpful in Bhakti Yoga there's a one practice called Archan in which one keeps a statue a deity of Krishna Radha Krishna and uh, that one can decorate the deity offer flowers and so on and one can sit before the deity and behold the beauty of the deity while chanting and this also helps to focus the mind and the f because the first thing that the vibration of Nam will reveal is that form 
So you're not there yet, you're not seeing the form in your heart yet. So when you see the deity, and though the deity, Krishna in the deity form, he can sing and dance and do everything, but he's standing very still to make your mind become still. And so that the, the, to do uh, puja, to do worship, offering incense, offering flowers, finding the, all these activities to fix the mind on the deity. Because that's the first thing that Nam will reveal. Nam and then Rup, the form, then qualities, then associates, then pastimes come last. So Archan, serving the deity, is a very supportive process to the growth of your devotion. You know, when someone's growing a plant, then when the plant is small, they put a stick in the ground and they tie it to the stick to help it grow. So like that. To make progress in your chanting, the, the performance of our channel worship of the deity in the temple gives a support to that. Good question. And if you disagree, no problem. You can give some reason why you disagree or some evidence from scripture and we can discuss because it's a deep, it's a deep topic. Uh, usually what happens if someone actually doesn't have realization, they're really thinking, ah, there's something else I have to do uh, to make the realization come. But if someone is actually chanting the mantra, avoiding the ten obstacles, there are ten obstacles, you know, ten types of nam apparat, then the mantra just opens by itself. Uh, so if you're not experiencing an awakening of realization by chanting, it's not because you're not doing some visualization, visualization right. It's because of the presence of the ten obstacles, the ten types of nama parat. Chaitan Mahaprabhu said, "Taramadhi sarvashastha nama sankirtan nirapurad nam lale pai prema dhan." Of all the practices of bhakti, chanting is the best. And if one will simply give up the ten types of obstacles, then prema appears in the heart. That's it. So the only thing standing between us and the brain, the transcendental love, are those ten types of Nam Aparat. So it's worth studying them and um, associating with devotees who know them very deeply and hearing the nuances. Because it looks like ten, but it's actually ten categories. And within those ten there are many small details as well. And if, we, if we're committing those offenses, if we're entangled with those obstacles, then we won't have an internal experience from chanting. So that's a really important topic. I was just a, a few months ago, I was in uh, Goa. We had a festival of Vedic culture in Goa. And we had a, a five day seminar on how to overcome those internal obstacles in chanting. And that's where we really need to focus. Uh, if the mantra hasn't started to expand and, and give revelation yet, that's where we should be focusing.